Hi, Misha here. And if you came from the main Mishiko channel over here, thanks. Um, put up a video over there comparing, well, not comparing, kind of putting the Type 94 Nambu and the Japanese A6M Zero or Zeke together. Kind of one of those model and gun reviews I do. And if you didn't, if you're just on the Misha channel here, welcome anyway, and go check out the Misha Co channel. So, yeah, I thought I would lay out three models of the Zero. The two that look extremely similar are both from Corgi. They're supposed to be an A6M2 and an A6M3. I really can't tell any difference, and to be fair, the differences weren't that great between the two, at least externally. And the third one is a little different. This is an A6M5 from Air Force One. So, these are all three die-cast, 172 scale. And there you have it. <clears throat> Well, most everyone knows about the Zero. It is the most famous Japanese military aircraft fighter of all time. It was the most mass-produced Japanese plane of World War II. And one of the most produced planes of World War II in general. This began way back in the 1930s. In 1937, the Japanese Navy was getting its new A5M, known as the Claude, in service. It was a carrier-based fighter, but they were already wanting a new design. So they put out requests to Mitsubishi, and Nakajima to make a new carrier based fighter and it needed to have very long range be able to go 310 miles per hour climb up to a reasonable altitude be armed with two cannons two machine guns and able to carry at least two bombs and again launch from a fighter therefore it needed a wingspan of no greater than 12 meters. Well, Nakajima immediately just kind of bowed out in 1938. They thought the design specs were impossible. But Mitsubishi kept on, and uh, really just, you know, a short time later, April 1st of 1939, the first prototype of what would become the Zero uh, flew. Basically, they were able to achieve the speed and range by making the plane as compact and light as possible. This is why it did not have self-sealing fuel tanks and why the armor was essentially non-existent. To get the wings short enough, they had folding tips. The original prototype had a two-bladed propeller they would go to a three-bladed propeller to address a few questions. Oh, one other requirement the Japanese Navy had, they had to carry a full radio, two-way radio on board, which was a pretty new technology for a naval plane at the time, and had some weight. Anyway, the first prototype flew in spring of 40, uh, 39, and uh, yeah, after a few tweaks and whatnot, the kind of pre-production planes were put into service in uh, the Chinese theater in the summer of 1940. First seen combat in September of that year where Japanese planes shot down Russian planes being flown by the Chinese and had a very good combat record. The original plane, A6M-1, A for naval base carrier, Six for being the sixth model, and M for Mitsubishi, 
the M1 is kind of the pre-production. Then very quickly they would go to the A6 M2 which was pretty much the most famous version which had up uh, you know just tweaks to the engines and stuff I'm not really gonna get into all the variants here because they're mostly internal to do with engines the most famous and widely produced would probably be the A6 M2-21 this would have been entering into service in 1941 and the premier fighter when World War II kicked off the Japanese Navy had a little over 500 in service in December of 1941 it was known for its extreme range and maneuverability it also had very good speed it, it, it could it, at first it was a little under that 300 10 miles per hour but when they went to the M2 and they went to the new engine they were actually able to get up to about 315 even 320 miles per hour they would use these to great effect in fact it was pretty much considered the best naval based fighter in the world before and during the earliest parts of World War II it was so good that it could actually go up against land-based fighters, which before most naval fighters were kind of at a disadvantage for uh, you know obvious weight and restriction reasons. It would handily defeat one-on-one -on -one equally skilled pilots, the F-4F Wildcat, also the P-39 Aracobra. It was superior to the P-40. But the P-40 did have a few things going for it. It was faster, and it was more durable. So, the unit, the Flying Tigers, could give the could give the Zero a run for its money, but still the Zero was technically superior in a lot of ways. They would introduce the a6M3 with a more powerful but heavier engine in 42. There would be a couple of versions. First, the Model 32 and then the Model 22, which fixed some problems. The problem with the, the M3 32, it had a more powerful engine, which would theoretically let it go faster. But then they did things like upgrade the ammo and the cannons. And they made some other changes to the wings and stuff that actually added weight. So the first version of the M3 was only a tiny bit faster than the M2. But then with the model 22 version of the M3, they went back to the folding wing tips. And they improved things quite a bit. But yeah, the, uh, the first versions of the M3 really sacrificed the plane's range, which was one of its key features, aside from speed. And the second version restored a lot of that by adding additional fuel tanks, because what happened with the first version, the big engine, the larger engine, required a smaller fuel tank. So, anyway, they had to rejigger it a bit. The point is, by late 1942, the a 6 m 3 was pretty much replacing all of the older A6M2s in frontline service. The M2s were basically retired to secondary use and training and so on and so forth. This year was pretty good, but the Battle of Midway was a turning point in a lot of ways in the war. Even though the Americans are still flying older planes, they had developed new techniques like the thatch weave to kind of at least partially make up for the Zero's qualities. And then in July of that year, America found a crash but barely damaged A6M2 and completely stripped it apart really took a look at the plane. You know the story. They figured out that it kind of sucked in a dive, and, you know, 
didn't have self fuel uh, sealing fuel tanks and after that they began training their pilots on how to exploit the weaknesses it's another thing in the beginning of the war Japanese pilots had the advantage they had been you know flying in in China for up to a year and American pilots were green but as the war went on 42 and into 43 American pilots received better training and there were more experienced pilots and a lot of the Japanese pilots that had experience were getting killed or at least maimed and no longer flying so they were losing expertise and then meanwhile the Japanese training which originally had been excellent was going downhill because of the war putting pressure finally new American planes were coming into theater you have the P-38 which came in late 42 then you had the F-4U which started to appear in the first half of 43 but then in the second half of 43 the real game changer with the Zero came in. That would be the F6F Wildcat, which was equal or even superior to the Zero or the Zeke as the Allied name for it was in most ways. Kind of in response to this, they worked on this version here, which was the A6M5 which some considered to be the best version of the plane. They were really hoping to get away from the Zero by 1943, go to a whole new design, but attempts to go to other designs more advanced were stamp, uh, you know, stifled and held back through all kinds of delays and design production difficulties getting engines, so they had to keep kind of upgrading the Zero to the best of their abilities. What had been a very modern plane before and at the beginning of World War II was quickly becoming outdated and outclassed by everything in the sky. It's just that was that kind of war. Nevertheless, the M5 introduced quite a few updates and upgrades. It was faster yet. This could get up to 350 miles per hour. More importantly, they at least partially fixed its issue in a dive. It could, it could dive a little better, a little more effective, without losing control. It maintained the range. They also helped the engine. They gave it new, uh, basically, exhaust pipes. They went to a new pattern of radio, which was more effective, more reliable. You can tell it by the shorter antenna. Little tweaks again, nothing earth shattering, but you know, yeah, they, they existed. And actually, most of the M5s, the, the first ones are still made by Mitsubishi, but most of them were actually made by Nakajima, who had been ordered to start up zero production right before the attack on Pearl Harbor, so November of 41. So most of your M5s are made by them. This would be the Model 52, also, by the way. These would start to be used in late 1943, and they would see their biggest, most important use in the air in June of 44, which in the whole thing that became known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot, in which 300 Zeros were shot down, many of them A-5s. This was important because it essentially broke the back of the Japanese Navy when it came to air power. They, after this, were no longer able to really do uh, offensive air operations. And most of their carriers would soon be at the bottom of the ocean too, so they had to use escort carriers or just operate their fighters from land. And the Zero had been operated from land since the very beginning, even though it was a naval carrier fighter. They meant for it to be used both ways. And that's really about it. I mean, you can go on. There's a lot about the tactics. It's a very interesting plane. But um, they tried several other versions. The A6M4 was only experimental. The A6M6 first appeared in late 1944. 
but was only made in small numbers. It did introduce self-sealing fuel tanks. Um, so it had some improvements, but it was actually a much heavier plane, so it was again sacrificing range, but at this point range was less important than it had been earlier. The, uh, the last version to really go into production at all was the A6M7, which was a dive bombing uh, version, which could carry uh, a 550 pound bomb on the center line. And there was to be an A6M8, but they had some issues. This was going to have a much bigger, more powerful engine. Actually, one that Mitsubishi had been wanting to use for a long time, but the military had been resistant. They finally gave in. But they were having some issues with it. They finally got them ironed out in July of 1945. So, yeah, not exactly real useful timing there, guys. There was even a float plane, plane version. And, of course, the U Zero was used as a kamikaze plane, first informally and later formally. These would be specially modified A6M2s and later A6M5s. And, you know, Kamikaze is a story in and of itself. They would produce just shy of 11,000 of these. So a very large number. You had your two main factories building them, but you had uh, hundreds, thousands of subcontractors making components. It's just a really neat plane. I've always liked the aesthetic, the uh, kind of design choices of the Zero. And it's just as uh, iconic of a World War II plane in my mind as the P-51 Mustang or the Spitfire. It was very much ahead of its time, very economical. Uh, a great plane, but, you know, whereas America improved and went to new models, the Japanese kind of kept trying to band-aid solution and keep the Zero relevant when what they really needed, and, and they knew it too, but they just weren't able to make it happen. They really needed a whole new plane, and it just, it just didn't happen. And while the M5 was the best of the Zeros, by the time it was really being used in 1944, it was just being owned by the F6, F Hellcat, and the P38 Lightning, and the F4U Corsair. It's just, uh, was too little too late. It was a good plane, but just... Didn't really give them enough. <clears throat> it's a reasonably sized plane, but it's not huge. It has a wingspan of about 29 feet. It's about, excuse me, a wingspan of about 39 feet. It's about 29 feet long. As I said, it has two cannons, 20 millimeter, 20 millimeter cannon. Early versions held 60 rounds each. Later versions would hold 100. It also had two 7.7 millimeter machine guns. It could carry either two 150 pound bombs or one 550 pound bomb in the middle. But of course that came at a cost. It could get, like I said, anywhere from about 315 up to 350 miles per hour depending on the exact version. And it could get up to about 33,000 feet. So, very respectable performance. It was weak in a dive, but it was very maneuverable. Very good turner. Wasn't the fastest plane out there, but it still wasn't slow. And uh, pilots seemed to enjoy it. And it's worth pointing out, it did have a relatively small cockpit. There wasn't a whole lot of room for the guy to move around. Certainly nothing like a P-40. <laughs> And of course, after the war, these would be taken out of service in Japan, and production would end with the war in August of 1945. And that's, again, just a really brief rundown. There's, uh, there's so much to be said about the Zero. As to the models here, real quick, these two Corgi are from their Warbird series, so they're kind of their basic models, you know, $20 models. The landing gear don't go up or down, they're just up. There's no crew figure, but you do still get a cockpit. You get a turning propeller. They are pretty much all metal. Maybe a thing. There we go. And they come with an, actually a pretty respectable stand. The Air Force One, you really don't see anything about these. 
they're pretty much the same feature set landing gear is up turning propeller cockpit with no crew this is part of their Smithsonian series it has a uh, I think it's a drop tank it might be meant to be a bomb but it does have uh, uh, something under the fuselage which is kind of neat some of these websites report this as an A6M2 some report it as an A6M5 but based on the thicker wings and the shorter radio antenna I think it is supposed to be an M5 but feel free to pitch in what you guys think also it's said to be from the the, the Battle of Saipan and that was 1944 and so by 44 the M2 should have been long out of any kind of frontline service it should have been the M5 by 44 so that's my uh, Holmesian deductive reasoning to figure out which version they meant for this to be it does come with your typical Air Force One metal stand that's screwed together and it plugs in very nicely so I really like it it's a neat one the Corgi is a little more elegant maybe a little more detailed but the the Air Force One is very metal very solid feeling so they both have their things and price wise these are about twenty dollars too maybe twenty five but that's part of the the Smithsonian series which you don't see a lot of these days well guys I hope you enjoyed it I have other videos on more modern Japanese fighters like the F1 and F2 and their version of the F15 so if interested you might check those out if you have time and like I said if you did not come here from the Mishiko channel check that out as we have another video on these along with Nambu pistols any questions or comments, please do post them below. As always, this is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.